Hello, and welcome to the very first webinar in our new educational series on point of care ultrasound. I'm Jeunez Castonguay, VP of Marketing at Clarius. The topic for today, bullseye, why ultrasound is now the standard for guiding injections. It's such a pleasure to see so many of you here today with hundreds of your peers across so many different specialties, including pain management, anesthesiology, um, and of course, orthopedics, sports medicine, physiatry, rheumatology, general practice, and so many more. As you well know, um, there are just simply too many adults suffering from chronic pain. And that's why it's so wonderful to see so many of you here today as we explore the standards in using POCUS for guiding uh, injections of pain medication. Without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce you to our host for today. Dr. Oran Frankel is trained in emergency medicine in California. He's been using point of care ultrasound for his entire career. He now practices in a busy academic hospital in Vancouver as an emergency physician. Dr. Frankel is a passionate POCUS educator and we're just thrilled at Clarius to have welcomed him this summer as chairman of the medical advisory board. Welcome Dr. Frankel. Thanks Janez and thanks everyone for joining us today. We're launching our inaugural webinar series today with a topic that really affects every single healthcare practitioner that pretty much I've ever met. Uh, we all see patients who come in pain. And this statistic from 2016, that one in five Americans suffers from chronic pain is mirrored worldwide in reports from the WHO too. So we know this is an international crisis in some ways of patients who are experiencing chronic pain. And in some ways, this chronic pain crisis has become all the more acute in recent days. We know, especially locally here in Vancouver in the West Coast and across North America, we're seeing rises in the number of deaths from overdose from opiates and our opioid crisis. And then in the current COVID situation, all of these factors have just gotten even worse. We have physician offices closed, hard to reach. We have patients who are turned away. And we also know we're facing a shortage of pain management specialists to help us cope with the patients who come in with chronic pain. And so really in this acute crisis, we're trying to find new ways of dealing with it and how to cope and what as healthcare practitioners we can do to really help our patients the best. We do know that best practices for pain management are really multimodal. Uh, outdated approach to just opiates and other medications has led to a lot of these patients being turned away. There's headlines across, especially North America, of patients who are left stranded with pain um, and really unable to find the cures and treatments that they need because there's all this stigma, particularly around the opioid epidemic and drug use. And But a multimodal approach allows us to really engage our patients, help their suffering, and bring them the relief both they and we as their practitioners want and need. But this multimodal approach often seems out of reach. We've heard about uh, different complex procedures, but we often don't think about the really simple ones. We don't necessarily need to reach for things like epidural adhesiolysis or stimulators of the spinal cord. We have low complexity procedures that many of us were trained on previously that can bring our patients significant relief, trigger point injections, joint injections, and nerve blocks. And yet we're challenged, especially in a lot of our training, that we learn to do these procedures blind. We were basically jamming needles in people based on anatomic landmarks, hoping we hit the right target. And the problem with blind injections is twofold. One is that we don't have good accuracy, meaning we miss the bullseye uh, over and over again, and we don't have good precision. Maybe I'm really good at seeing my landmarks and knowing where I'm going, but I'm actually in the wrong place and I'm in the wrong place every time. So ultimately what we really want is high precision, high accuracy. And the way this plays out is in challenges that we all face with blind injections. So I wanted to run this poll with you and see, go through some of the challenges that we all experience with blind injections and see how many of you, if you could engage, experience the same problems. Uh, and I wanna sort of report on the findings at the end and see that we're all in this together. So the first one is inaccurate dosing. Uh, are you, really getting your injection to the bullseye or are you missing your ultimate target? There's imprecise injections. Are you requiring bigger and bigger dosing? I remember in my training, especially when we were doing dental blocks, that 
the mantra was just add more anesthesia because then you would make sure you really hit the nerve with what you need. So are you requiring larger doses than what you need because you're imprecise? These are painful procedures because you're doing them blind, right? Are you scraping bone? Have you had to puncture tissues nearby the target in order to reach where we really want to go? Have we experienced that you had inadequate pain relief from your, from your patients reporting back to you? Did you need to repeat the procedure over and over again? Did they need to come back for another injection? And ultimately, and this is all anonymous, if you've ever experienced a complication during one of the procedures, even if it worked, did you have to recover uh, an issue of the injection going into the wrong place? Was there the lancinating pain of an intraneural injection? Or was there even possibly a more significant complication like an arterial puncture? Or was the pleura hit and causing a pneumothorax? All of these are things we've all engaged in blind injections and problems we've all faced. And I kind of want to see where everybody's at. So, we can see, I would say, uh, I think you can all see the results. Imprecise is probably the most common. And as a result, we experience that we have to repeat a lot of the procedures. Thankfully, not a ton of complications, but still a surprising amount, right? One in five of us have is, has seen an, a complication of blind injection in our patients. And the inaccuracy and the pain that's associated with blind injections is really a challenge. And I think that's probably what motivated all of you to join our webinar today. And it's what really gives me a lot of pleasure to invite our special guest, our expert speaker today, who's Dr. David Rosenblum. He's the director of pain management at Maimonides Medical Center, a WAPMU instructor and faculty, and the host of the, the, host of the pain exam podcast, uh, basically, Dr. Rosenblum is a double black belt in ultrasound guided pain management procedures. And I'm so happy he's here to help us really see how we can get past a lot of our challenges with blind injections and use ultrasound better in our practice. Thank David, you, over to you. Sure. Thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here. Thank you, Clarice. Um, Oren, the, the, what you were talking about before with the blind injections was reminding me of a patient I saw earlier this week who presented with post-vasectomy pain. And he was telling me how the urologist gave him a general branch of the general femoral nerve block after his surgery for the post-operative pain and stuck him many times and gave a large volume of local. And he said it didn't even help. It actually hurt him more. So when I do the procedure on this patient, I guarantee I'll use the ultrasound and I will not need many needle passes or as much volume. That's a big part of the ultrasound. And I brought a few cases uh, to present today to kind of highlight all of these, uh, the, the, the versatility of working with an ultrasound in the field of pain management. So the first case is actually someone who I've known for a long time. I, I've worked with them and she's a 61 year old female with multiple com comorbidities. She suffers from hypertension, GERD, asthma, sleep apnea, She's had pulmonary embolisms, DVT, erosive esophagitis, falls, breast cancer. She's been on and off of blood thinners, Coumadin. She's had lap banding because she was obese and then removal of the banding, gastric bypass, carpal tunnel release, laparoscopic cholecystectomy, lumpectomy, DNC. It goes on and on. Temporal artery biopsy, mm -hmm. knee replacements bilaterally, paniculectomy, and of course, a laminectomy. Okay, she had hernia repairs. I mean, yeah, I could keep going on and on, but this patient is the epitome of a chronic pain patient, but the patient um, came to me multiple times for multiple uh, pain problems over the years. She's, she's obese. She, like I said, she's on Coumadin and has been on opiates. And most would think she's a complete train wreck. However, that being said, she's a lovely woman and when she gets relief from my injections, she actually comes off the opiates. She's not a chronic opiate user. She has no addictive tendencies. And the great thing about her is she responds to the, the interventions and uh, they minimize her, her drug use as well as improve her quality of life. That's really speaking to you know, the multimodal approach that the, you know, we don't have to turn these patients away just because they're on opiates. Not everyone who's been prescribed opiates for their chronic pain. A lot of times physicians feel like they don't know what else to do. So they end up with these prescriptions and then they're turned away because it shows up on their prescription record and you know, they're That's just right. seeking relief. I mean, she's the, she's the ideal opiate 
uh, candidate, someone who uses it when they need it and when they feel better, doesn't use it. Uh, she has chronic neck and low back pain, um, headaches, which we've used some migraine medications, CGRP drugs, spinal cord stimulator for failed back surgery syndrome. And I started doing PRP, and this is something that the ultrasounds really helped out with. So her, her neck was bothering her. I use the ultrasound to do the ultrasound guided PRP injections into the facet joints in her neck. She had a lot of relief with that. So she presented with foot pain in the plantar fascia. She's been to the podiatrist. She's had steroid shots as well as the orthotics, failed all of that. And because her neck and her sacroiliac joint responded so well to PRP injections that she asked for me to do it to her, to her plantar fascia. So she's a nurse, she understands the risk of steroids, especially someone who's been in, um, in pain for so long, getting all epidural steroid injections, someone with all these comorbidities, you could imagine why she doesn't wanna use steroids. So just to review briefly, this is the anatomy of the, of the foot, the heel. You have the plantar fascia at the bottom, the fat pad, the tarsal tunnel, which is like the carpal tunnel of the foot. The tibial nerve runs through it with the blood vessels and tendons. And here's a medial malleolus. The plantar fascia is often accompanied by with a heel spur. This is the fascia and this is the tender area that's inflamed typically. It's one of the most common causes of heel pain, or it is the most common cause of heel pain. It's greatest amongst the 40 to 50 year olds, with a two to one female to male preponderance. On pathology, there are microscopic tears of the fascia, there's inflammation, fibrosis, myxoid degeneration of collagen tissue. So here I'm going to describe and show you images of a plantar fascia injection under ultrasound guidance. And the code for that would normally be a 20550 for the plantar fascia injection. And the ultrasound guidance code is a 76942. It's not a bundled code, unlike the joint injections. But because we use PRP, you don't bill that code because it's not, it wouldn't be appropriate. You do a 0232T code, which is an experimental code that's not typically reimbursed. And I did a tibial nerve lock for preoperative analgesia or anesthesia to lessen the pain of the injection because I do not like to mix local anesthetic with the PRP because it can inhibit the effects. So I, I placed the patient on her side. This was comfortable for her so I could get the tibial nerve above the medial malleolus, but I scanned upwards to find it. And so you're doing the nerve block to prepare for the procedure, right? That's right. Uh, I'm an yeah. anesthesiologist. So I, I want her to feel some sort of anesthesia before I stick a needle in her and pressurize a very inflamed area. So I gave her a, a tibial nerve block and here's a tibial artery. And you can see next to it, a, a hyperlucent structure. And it's a little hard to see on this one, but I'll show you soon. The nerve is right next to the artery and, I, and I'm going to use a 25 gauge, one and a half inch needle to surround the nerve and deposit the local anesthetic. I love you pre-anesthetize the skin right before here. you puncture. Yes. Usually a vapor coolant spray, sometimes doing a skin wheel can be more painful than just sticking in a 25 gauge needle itself. The, ner the nerve is over here and we're just surrounding it. The, the, the artery is one of the landmarks for the nerve. And from this bupivacaine infiltration, which I use about four or five ml, she was numb for about at least a day. Yeah. Normally bupivacaine is two to six hours. However, certain nerves such as the popliteal fossa as, uh, as well as uh, tibial nerve can last longer. Now here I'm taking the probe, I'm finding the calcaneus right here and the plantar fascia just comes out, uh, out uh, here. Where I just turn the orientation and I did this to find the view so I could do an in-plane approach. I, I'm cleaning the skin right now. And I'm just going to go in with a 25 gauge needle. This bone here is the, are the metatarsal bones, okay? We already moved away from the calcaneus. And this is the fat pad. I'm above the fat pad into the plantar fascia. Uh, you can beautifully see it's a 25 gauge and you can see a beautifully superficial plantar fascia. Yeah. Look at the bevel. Yeah. I mean, you have great resolution here. And of course, with this shot, you don't want any resistance on injection. It's just a fascial plane. You're trying to really spread it around the fascia. Correct, correct. Could you and just do this injection with, uh, do people ever use just anesthesia or steroids on the plantar fascia? I, I'm not aware of any studies with just local anesthetic alone. Um, steroids can help. I've, I've used it many times, but she preferred the PRP 
Mm -hmm. um, and, and I don't blame her, especially with and all of her comorbidities. Sure. Would, would she get relief uh, for plant, her plantar fascia pain just from the posterior tibial nerve block too? Well, it would, it, that would temp temporarily help. I don't imagine yeah. that would give her long-term pain relief if she does have pathological changes of that fascia. However, every now and then I do a, a, a nerve block with just local alone, and I get weeks to months to years of relief. I've, I've seen that with genicular blocks, which is lidocaine alone for post-operative knee. I've seen that with medial branch blocks for facet arthropathy or back pain. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I love using the way you use the block, right? Like any one of us uh, who's on this webinar now who's ever tried to directly anesthetize the foot knows what a painful procedure that is of jabbing a needle into the sole of your foot, either for foreign body removal or a laceration repair, abscess, or to just do a regular procedure on top of it. Uh, it really takes away, it turns it into essentially a painless procedure like you did. It's really right. great. Yeah, exactly. And when you have a painful area, sometimes even injecting a local into that painful area can just trigger. Oh, it's the worst. It's the worst. Everyone in the ER hears it when we do it in the ER. It's a scream. It's it's not pleasant for anybody. Right. Yeah. Okay. So here's a, here's our second case, which is a 67-year-old female with right hip pain, history of diabetes and hypertension, appendectomy in the past. On exam, the patient had slight pain on internal and external hip rotation with the joint flexed. Marked tenderness over the greater trochanteric bursa. Now, a bursa injection is like a major, a great, uh, greater trochanter is like a major joint injection or a major bursa injection CPT code. I use 20611. Mm -hmm. That's a bundled ultrasound and joint or bursa injection code. If there was no imaging accompanying this, it would be a 20610, which was the original code. A few years ago, this was, this was a separate code from the ultrasound read, the 76942, but now they're a bundled code. So just to review some anatomy, and it's more than the bursa on, on this uh, picture, but it's just good to review. So you have the bursa to the side of the greater trochanteric bursa, where you have the insertion points of the gluteus medius tendon. You have the hip external rotators also inserting piriformis. Of note here, you have the sciatic nerve, the L4, L5 nerve roots, and anterior to the posterior sacrum, you have the sacral roots all forming the sciatic nerve. And you can see the piriformis and its relation to the sciatic nerve, which is very important for our piriformis syndrome, and even the hamstrings. And you can appreciate every, every now and then, I've even been fooled where I see a patient with hamstring tendonitis and it, they present like a sciatica patient. So the ultrasound could help guide the needle here as well as identify pathology. So this, so in general, when we talk about hip injections with the ultrasound, I prefer the anterior approach. It's more superficial and I can see the femoral artery, nerve and vein, and I can avoid them. I think it's less painful as well. The posterior approach is typically what I would use with a C-arm or an X-ray. And I may do that on a very obese patient, someone who I don't feel comfortable using an ultrasound with. And Typically, it's steeper and it can hurt more, but I even on the obese patients these days, I'm using the ultrasound because the resolution is so good. Even with a high frequency probe like mine, I could still see it on the, on the, more, on the larger patients. How deep, how deep can you see the, the hip joint? Well, from the anterior approach, it's usually not more than six centimeters, even on big patients. However, mm -hmm. you, know, with, 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 you could go up to seven or eight. So the position I use for the ultrasound is typically a view where I'm trying to go, not necessarily um, lateral, more like an oblique to get into the line of the uh, neck of the femur and visualize the head. It could be more parallel than this picture or like this picture. The key is you see the neck and you see the head. And you know, you do have the iliopsoas muscles and tendons overlying the, the, uh, the, the hip joint. And one thing about the hip joint, unlike with a lot of other joints, you're not aiming at that hyperlucent space over here. You're actually aiming at the head, which I'll show you in the video, because of this, there's bone over here, it's gonna interfere with your access to the joint. So that's the neck of the femur. Iliopsoas muscle. And the femoral head. It was always tendon. And so your approach is to come in and aim for kind of the, the femoral neck area or like the, the base of the, the head there? 
Yeah, I mean, my, my needle will come from lateral and I would go mm -hmm. in plane and I would aim towards more or less the, the head of the femur. Mm -hmm. Even if you're in the neck, you could be in the capsule. But you don't and have what to... are you injecting in the in the hip joints? Where I'm 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 going to get what what, what are oh, you what? injecting? Excuse me. Mm -hmm. uh, usually steroid and local anesthetic. The visco yeah, supplements yeah. don't have the same track record as they do with the knee. They're also not FDA approved. Uh, every now and then, maybe a PRP shot, but I find less with the hips, more with the knees. I've had patients from the ER come and tell me after doing a hip injection with steroid uh, and a follow-up call that they were back on the salsa dance floor, you know, the next day and were lo like loving me. It was like the best thing that anyone had ever done for them. And all it took sure. was, you know, five minutes of time. Right. It, it, hmm. They're great to a point when the yeah. joint is gone, <laughs> right. yeah. you're probably a joint replacement. But yeah, yes. right. A hundred percent. Okay. So. The greater trochanteric bursa is right here. And you can even see here, you have a muscle uh, with the tendon tapering down. There's a bunch of muscles that, that insert on the, on the greater trochanter, but you could see here, this may be the bursa, this black line right there. If, it, if it's larger or uh, uh, this black line means that it could be a bursitis, it could be filled with fluid or in inflammatory fluid. You could have the patient in this position or you could have them, this is the right lateral decubus position. You could have them standing, you could have them prone, you can have them supine. There's all sorts of ways to do it. Sometimes if the patient's comfortable standing, I just do it. It's a very quick and easy injection. And it usually does a lot of good for the patients. Once again, the greater trochanter, here you have the gluteus medius, muscle tapering to the tendon and inserting on it. Sometimes it's not the bursa, it's the tendon and it has a tendinopathy. This tendon here does not look pathological. You have a night, nice outline of the tendon here on both sides. It's not so heterogeneous. There's something called anisotropy, which is when you don't have a perfect orientation in, in line with the tendon and it does look pathological. However, this tendon looks pretty good to me. Here you have gluteus medius and gluteus maximus. Okay, this is a injection of the greater trochanteric bursa here. For some reason, the patient was more comfortable lying on their side. So I used my, my ultrasound to uh, find the bursa. And right now I'm a little posterior. I'm gonna use a vapor coolant spray to anesthetize the skin. I like to use a 25 gauge, three and a half inch spinal needles. I find that they're very, uh, they're less painful. Um, and they're usually very easy to visualize and you don't see it yet, but you'll see it later on in the video. And, I, and this is a very similar injection when I'm actually doing the bursa as well as I'm doing the, um, the tendons. It's a similar approach and depends on the patient and where their pain is. Mm -hmm. And here's the bursa, well, you'll see it in a second. Yeah, how bursa. do you decide to do the greater trochanter injection versus yeah. the hip joint itself? Well, they often come together. Oftentimes mm -hmm. I see patients with sacroiliac joint pathology along with the, with the bursa or, or hip joint uh, pathologies, but it really depends on what's, what's more tender at, at the time of presentation. And you know, there's a needle over there. You can see it coming in. And basically um, this patient just had a more tender greater trochanter. A lot of patients say, oh, I, I lie on my side at night and it's killing me the pain. So that's one way of doing it. Oftentimes the hip pain patients will radiate to the groin, may radiate down the leg towards the knee. The hip pain can mimic sciatica, sciatica can mimic hip pain. So there, there's, there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of overlap with these syndromes. And sometimes the only way to make a diagnosis is to do a diagnostic injection, possibly into the SI joint or the hip joint and mm -hmm. see if they feel better. So sometimes the, the intervention can even be diagnostic. Oh, many times. I mean, there are times mm -hmm. when I would just give lidocaine into the hip and then the patient walks around and they say, wow, I feel amazing. So then I'll <laughs> just, do, you know, do the steroid in the hip. If it's somebody mm -hmm. who's a brittle diabetic and I don't want to waste the steroid, if I'm not hundred percent sure that the pathology is coming from the hip. Right. Makes sense. So here we have a case of a 73 year old with bilateral chronic knee pain. He presents asking about injections of the knee. He's already tried the steroids. He's already tried the visco supplement. He suffers from coronary artery disease as well as COPD. He has a significant past surgical history of right arthroscopic meniscectomy. Very common that patients after meniscectomy go on and still have arthritis and knee pain. 
Crepitus is present on the knee exam with flexion bilaterally. There's also tenderness on the medial aspect of the joint, negative drawer sign, ortho advised knee replacement, and the patient wants alternatives. So in, in my practice, typical alternatives after they failed or don't want the steroid or the visco supplement would be a genicular nerve block. I've done saphenous nerve blocks. I've done PRP. I've done mesenchymal stromal cells or bone marrow aspirate. And I've also done neuromodulation where we actually put wires on the saphenous or genicular nerves. And they could be implanted uh, temporarily or, per or permanently. So just to review some knee anatomy, here you have the sciatic nerve, tibial nerve is central lateral is the common peroneal nerve. And if you're an anesthesiologist, they always ask on our boards about peroneal neuralgia in the lithotomy position. If a patient's in the lithotomy position for hours, the fibular head could get compressed and compress the peroneal nerve and cause a foot drop or peroneal neuralgia. The more relevant for the knee, you have the saphenous nerve, the infrapatellar branch, which is amenable to nerve block, as well as cryotherapy or lesioning or neuromodulation to treat nerve pain. And of note, you do have something called the IPAC block, which is a nerve block I do under ultrasound where you put a needle between the tibial nerve and artery and the actual posterior capsule of the knee joint. And it's great for posterior capsule pain of the knee. So just a quick uh, review. We have a slide of the patella with the patella tendon, and this is the tibia, the femur is up north. And if you look at this slanty line, that is the ACL. Oh, I'm and, not used to seeing the ACL on the knee joint. Yeah. And to it's, orient, you know, this is the ultrasound on the anterior aspect of the knee, right? Or uh, That's right, the sagittal yeah. view of the anterior aspect of the knee. Mm -hmm. Like right there. Like that. <laughs> now you could, you could do knee injections a multitude of ways. You could come in plane, transverse, the knee bent sitting like this, or you could have a knee straight and come from above. I do it like this. In this video, I'm coming out of plane. I am just using the ultrasound to avoid contacting the bone. And I, I, um, I, I, I'm trying to avoid pain for the patient. So I'm not really seeing my whole needle trajectory here. And um, I'm inserting the needle after I find my anatomy. You know, I, I love knee injections. I use this as teaching people. This is like the gateway drug of ultrasound guided procedures uh, where, you know, this is a procedure we were all taught to do blind. We are overconfident in our ability to do it blind. And over and over again, we face a lot of those challenges we discussed at the beginning of this webinar and grabbing the ultrasound. This is like the procedure you could do. Anyone could basically do on their first day of having an ultrasound and learning to use it. And uh, it's such a dramatic leap in quality of care that it's really hard to go back. A hundred percent. When I, when I started my pain practice, I came to my hospital. There was one other pain doctor there and I requested an ultrasound in the pain office. And she looked at me like, why, why would you bring an ultrasound to the pain office? What are you going to do with it? Yeah. And I, I said to myself, I said, what am I not going to do with it? I treat <laughs> almost anything and everything with ultrasound. Of course, there are certain things I need the C-arm for, but even cervical and thoracic spine problems, for the cervical spine, you can do selective nerve root blocks, suprascapular nerve blocks with the ultrasound. With the thoracic spine, you can do thoracic paravertebral nerve blocks, even with patients with thoracic spine pain, radicular pain. And for the lumbar spine, you could do S1 foraminal injections with ultrasound. You could do caudal epidural steroid injections under ultrasound, facet joint injections, medial branch nerve blocks. Pa getting paid for some of these blocks may be a little tricky. However, there are payers, a few, that do pay for it. And you could always use some other documentation like a C-arm to actually verify it. So it's added such a dimension to my practice that that wasn't present before. So just mm -hmm. let me scroll backwards here. This is a picture of actually my patella. And on top of it, you have a thin black line, which is the pre-patella bursa. And they call this when it's inflamed, the housemaid's knee, a very sexist term, but that's, I guess the more politically correct term would be pre-patella bursitis. So we right. could call it that. And um, here you go. There would be more fluid or more hypodense structures in that uh, bursa if it was a bursitis. Now, this is an image of the lateral knee, lateral collateral ligaments right here. The ligament looks intact. You have your femur, your joint space, and the fibula. The probe is, 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 is coming to the side of the knee longitudinally. 
Okay, so the genicular nerves, I, I hope this slide's not making anyone dizzy because it's, it's really, there's a lot of disagreement in the literature as to the origin of the genicular nerves. What the genicular nerves are, they're a group of nerves that innervate the knee. This and maybe the suprascapular nerve block about, I don't know, five, six years ago are, are two blocks that really changed my practice. There are patients who were suffering for years, failed everything, and I did these, these nerve blocks on, and they, they either had amazing relief or even for some patients, I terminated their seven-year pain problem within one shot. Uh, people who had their knees replaced and they had pain and there was not much I could offer them except for maybe a saphenous nerve block, which was still in my mind kind of me just trying to figure something out because it really wasn't standard. The, when I did the genicular nerve block, it was like night and day. They mm -hmm. came back to me and they were complaining of other things. They didn't even think about their knee anymore. So the, I mean, the nerves... it, it makes such a good point. I, I think it's worth emphasizing that, you know, the nerve blocks, historically, they were just treated as, you know, anesthesia for a procedure or anesthesia for something. Right. And what you're saying is that it can actually cure in a lot of ways at times chronic pain conditions with a single nerve block, which is sort of a really pushing the paradigm of how we think about these procedures right. too. Look, it's not always going to cure it, but I've seen it happen. Sure. It, yeah. It, okay. It, it, 100%. <laughs> so... Um, okay, so the, the genicular nerves, um, there's literature saying the superior and inferior medial genicular nerves arise from the tibial and common peroneal nerves, yet other sources say the superior medial genicular nerve arises from the vastus medialis, which is a branch of the femoral nerve. The common peroneal nerve has been said to, to give rise to the superior lateral and inferior lateral genicular nerves, as well as the superior lateral genicular nerve, which, I, which has in other sources been from the nerve, the vastus lateralis, another femoral branch. So, you know, it's, it's something that I'm not gonna say 100% one way or another, but at the end of the day, if you know where to do the nerve block and you know why and all the, the proper ways to do it, you're fine. Um, these are, this is more for academic purposes. The big thing here is don't even bother with the inferior lateral genicular nerve, because if you target it, you can get a foot drop. It's right by that peroneal nerve. And the coding for this is a 64454 code. You could do it under X-ray or ultrasound. I used to do this under X-ray, and then I realized how easy it was with ultrasound. I added these X-ray images so you get an idea as to what we're looking at for the um, to kind of think in three dimensions as well. So here you have the superior medial genicular nerve, possibly coming from tibial or nerve vastus medialis, descending. It passes over the the uh, medial epicondyle of the distal femur. And then you have the inferior medial genicular nerve branch and the superior lateral genicular nerve branch coming from the common peroneal nerve, possibly. On a lateral view, you see the nerves running with the blood vessels towards the joints. You have the superior medial, and here's the inferior medial. On x-ray, your targets traditionally were these blue points, you're coming from an AP view, and then you check your lateral view. The vastus intermedius branch is a fourth potential uh, target above the patella. Most people do not use it, but it's good for subpatellar pain. And I have diamonds here at the revised recommendations, in case there's any pain doctors watching this. We, a lot of people used to do it up here. Now they're recommending to do it up here. And on ultrasound, I was able to trace the nerve and appreciate the fact that they're right. The nerve is more superficial and there's less soft tissue between your probe and the target, and hence it's easier to do the block. So speaking of the ultrasound views, here we go. You have the probe oriented longitudinally, but coming from the inside, visualizing the shaft of the femur and the epicondyle right here, and the artery next to the nerve. Okay, very clear image here. It's not always this clear, but this is, this is a great image. Now, the nerve is not always circular or oval or even long. It's, it takes a different course and it changes direction. So oftentimes this is how it will appear. It may appear larger, smaller, longer, and it can vary. Same thing with the artery. Here we have the artery and see, the artery looks a little different as I turn the probe horizontally. Okay, the nerve is probably this structure right here. Oh, it's really tiny. It's very tiny. Sometimes it requires a little imagination, but basically the general rule is these nerves run with the blood vessels. And if you inject even only one or two mLs over here, as you'll see soon in the movie, it's gonna spread in this vicinity and you'll be fine. You don't need a lot of volume for these nerve blocks. And historically these were just done with a C-arm or fluoro? Correct, with a C-arm, yeah. sometimes we would sedate the patient, put them to sleep, it could be painful. Wow. But if, if you watch the, the, the video I have coming up, you'll appreciate, 
let me just go back to the slide. Okay, here you have the superior lateral genicular nerve, the hyperlucency here, blood vessels probably right here. And here's a transverse view where you can see the actual blood vessel Doppler with the ultrasound. And with the, with the nerve, excuse me. And here's the bone. Okay, so here's a patient who I'm doing the block on. And I like to do it in this position, sitting up. Some people have the patient with their leg extended, lying down. I find this to be very easy. I found the blood vessel. The nerve is in this vicinity, possibly this structure. It sometimes change, or maybe this structure right here. We'll see in a second. Sometimes when you give the local anesthetic, the picture clears up a bit. So I use a 25 gauge, one and a half inch needle. My first injection is lidocaine, 2%. And the second injection is bupivacaine, usually half percent or quarter percent. Okay. If I had a, the, the nerve is probably this structure over here. And I noticed your screen is in your line of sight, right? So you try That's and kind right. of keep it with your, so you're not tweaking your body. You don't want to become one of your own patients. I, exactly. Mm -hmm. I don't need any neck pain. Yeah. So here we go. I'm looking at the in, in, infra, inferior medial, medial genicular nerve. Uh, this one is sometimes a little more painful. There's the artery right there. I put on this some, yeah. It's like, it's amazing. These tiny nerves are providing so much, you know, relief or so much uh, sensation to the patients. That's right. And the nerve was visualized right there. It's right here. Oftentimes when you're next to the nerve, the patient will say, ow, you know, I feel it creating <laughs> my knee. They'll tell you. Um, another thing you can do is when on yourself, you could feel that area above your epicondyles where my curse is on each side of your knee. There's a very sensitive spot right over mm -hmm. here. And that correlates to the, to the genicular nerves. And you can see she was a, she's a very stoic woman. She didn't really scream much and she tolerated the procedure well. Not very squeamish. Now I'm at the lateral branch. The arteries over here. The nerve is probably that structure right there. And I noticed you're treating these as a peripheral injections, basically. So the skin is clean, the probe is clean. Um, oh, yeah. Are you are you treating it differently if you're going into a joint space in terms of sterility? Uh, joint spaces, I, 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 well, either way, the probe cover is covered with Tegeter. Uh, joint spaces, I, joint spaces, I usually use alcohol or actually chlorhexidine or alcohol, depends on what I'm doing, depends on what joint. But I, you know, I thank God, knock on wood, I, I've only had two infections in my whole entire career. I've done thousands of nerve blocks of injections. And uh, the, uh, the two infections I ever had, one was a suprascapular nerve block done in the ICU. So I, as then that was a core prep, core hex. I try to be as sterile as possible, but it's an ICU still. Um, and the second was actually a uh, medial branch nerve block, um, which surprisingly, you know, that's a very sterile procedure. We, 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 we really are careful with that, but it happened. Um, thank God, never any of these shots in the office. And, I, and so, you have to be smart. I mean, I, the only thing that touches the patient is, is whatever I clean them with, a sterile ultrasound probe and the needle tip, which is sterile. Yeah, I, I guess I basically, you know, if I'm entering a joint, I take higher precaution uh, in the ER, which I would consider is maybe a dirty environment like the ICU. Sure. So uh, I'm, I'm putting the probe in a sterile, sterile glove or a sterile uh, sheath over it for those. But the, the peripheral blocks, you know, treating it as a clean procedure, basically. Sterile right. skin, nothing, nothing dirty is touching the skin, but uh, it's sure. it's not as much. When I'm doing a peripheral procedure outside of a joint, I often look at it as like you're getting an IV or a knee. Yeah. It's it's it has exactly. to be sterile, but it's you know different levels of sterility. Yeah. Um, okay, so moving on. Okay, uh, so I'm, I'm doing a lot of teaching online and in person. Uh, here are just some images from my courses. Here's an image of the spermatic cord for a general femoral nerve block. The nerve is usually in the uh, vicinity of the cord. And when you're injecting, the key is to make sure you're not getting into the spermatic uh, cord, vas deferens, or the vessel. There's a, the, I don't have Doppler on this, but the testicular artery is here. So you have to be very careful. Here's a beautiful image of an intercostal nerve right there. This is a cross section of a rib, intercostal muscles, 
This is the internal one, the external one, and here is the pleura. On it's patient amazing. Re yeah. with, with that resolution, like I just used to treat intercostal blocks as a plain block because that's the best I would see. I, I've never before seen the actual intercostal nerve. Yeah, it's not always visible, but you know, it depends on the patient, of course, how, how much adipose tissue they have. Um, and here is the pleura on many patients. You'll see this line moving. Um, and you know better than me being an ER doc. I believe when there's a pneumothorax, that line doesn't move so much. That's right. That's, right. that's one of the ways to diagnose a pneumothorax. And this is a beautiful image if you're a pain physician and, or if you do stellate ganglion blocks. Here's the thyroid. Here's a trachea, carotid artery. Longest coli is overlying the C6. Uh, you can't see the chest or the X tubercle here, but you see the transverse process. And the ganglion is right here. It's hard to actually see the ganglion, but this is your target. And I would never do a stellate ganglion block without an ultrasound in this day. <laughs> you can see the esophagus, even if you're using x-ray, the x-ray is not going to guide you around the esophagus. Once you give the contrast, it's too late if you get an esophagram. Yeah. Or big red is right there too. You got to be careful. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. Great. So um, I want to thank Claris for, um, for uh, enabling me to, to talk about my course. I'm giving an online course again on December 6th. I hope you guys can come. There's a discount for you who are attending this webinar. Just enter the discount, the coupon code CLARIS2020 for 30% off. And you can go to painexam.com. We have a newsletter. You could sign up with your email. Go to the events page, painexam.com slash events, and you'll see the schedule of my online courses. And I am doing a course the weekend of November 20th on Sunday in Manhattan. If you happen to be around, it will be very small. So the space is limited and we will be socially distancing. I didn't put this course up yet, but I plan to market it very soon. And uh, if you have any questions, please shoot me an email. My contact is on the website. Great. Thanks, Thanks so much, Dr. Rosenblum. Yeah. Um, Thanks so much for the great introduction of both entry level and the double black belt procedures that you do and uh, giving kind of a way in um, to both on using the ultrasound procedures. So I kind of just wanted to highlight some of the pro tips that both that uh, you showed us and uh, that we can capture from your demonstrations. You know, first was to anesthetize the skin, make it a painless procedure, put on the anesthesiology hat. And, you know, I have patients in the ER where if I follow that guideline of anesthetizing the skin, people are texting through the whole procedure, never even knew anything happened. And they're surprised when I tell them it's done. So it, it's such a good feeling to go from the screaming that I was trained on in medical school of like, it's just part of the procedure to, you know, painless, like ghost ninja procedure. Uh, I really love the, that change in practice. And it, I think it's a kind of impossible without the ultrasound. And then I really like, um, you know, screen in line of sight, don't tweak your body maintain good contact, aim for the screen is usually what I teach people. So as much as you can keep that screen where you can. And I think with the handheld world, it makes it a lot easier to really bring the screen in close uh, so that you can aim right for it. That was a great, great tip. Um, and then we talked a little bit about matching the prep to procedure, uh, you know, making sure that the sterility and cleanliness is matching so that you're really minimizing any risk of complications. And, and there's a couple that you wanted to bring up too here. Sure. Um, a trick that I teach my students is that when you're holding the, the ultrasound and you're trying to visualize your needle in plane, sometimes a good idea just to contact your, your probe or your, your two hands together at your fingers so that you're not moving too much. If you lose sight of your needle, jiggle the, the needle in and out just to tent up the skin and look for the distortions and then just scan laterally or medially to find the needle tip. And you want to see the whole body of the needle when you're injecting, unless you're intentionally doing out of plane injection, which I don't recommend if you're a beginner. Uh, the other advice I can give you is learn to be ambidextrous, okay? Because when you're doing the left side versus the right side, you don't want to be crossing your hands or feel awkward. So if while you're practicing and learning, you practice working both sides of your body, both sides of your brain to get comfortable, it's going to make you that more, more efficient and effective as you progress to become a black belt in ultrasound. <laughs> nice, yeah. And, you know, I think uh, I wanna thank you again for showing us kind of the different cases and really seeing how we could uh, 
really overcome a lot of those challenges we talked about in the beginning and to kind of bring it back with the, the advantages of ultrasound guidance that I've experienced in my practice. And I think you have too. Uh, first is this improved accuracy, just sort of knowing exactly where my injections are going. Um, you know, I teach my learners that study after study shows us that no matter how confident uh, practitioners think they are about getting the needles into joint spaces, when they put CT contrast in or they put them up against a gold standard, they're frequently missing, uh, sometimes up to 50% of the time in some of the studies we review. So really having the ultrasound and seeing that needle tip really improves accuracy about where the injections are going. And I yeah. think in this day and age, it's even more important uh, with, you know, you're using these adjuncts, visco supplementation, PRP. It's not just the nuclear bomb of steroid that as long as it's close enough, it's good enough. You know, now you need it to get exactly where you need it every time. So I can reduce the amount of medicine you're using for either the nerve blocks or for these more advanced procedures. And gone are the days of just put in more to make it work, right? Like we, we can't, hold ourselves to that standard anymore. Um, and I want every single patient to receive the benefit. You know, I want to hit that bullseye every time. Sure. And we alluded also, I think the decreased trauma results in decreased pain with the procedure, right? Uh, anesthetizing skin on a blind procedure, but still having to jam the bone or glide off of nearby structures for my landmarks, like we were all trained, you know, it's so much slicker and cleaner uh, and less traumatic for everyone. If you can just, you know where your needle's going, you can anesthetize the track. You know, I still use a 30 gauge. I don't really have the spray cold, uh, the, the vapor spray, but you know, even a 30 gauge barely felt. And then I can, I know where my needle track is going to go. It really makes it such a better, uh, more enjoyable experience. And then you alluded to safety. I think that's a big concern for a lot of practitioners. And, you know, if we're putting needles in patients, I often tell my learners, it's really hard to justify if you did have a complication, if you weren't using ultrasound, uh, I think, knowing exactly where we're going in this day and age when the when the ultrasound is nearby and not using it uh makes it harder to justify and like you said it allows you to bring these procedures that maybe you learned in a more tertiary care center hospital-based care into the office and do it safely uh so that you can see where things are and and you know in addition to the regular monitoring but really around the can procedure itself you, yeah 100 percent. Well, one thing to add I, I have patients now who go to other doctors or they come from other doctors offices and they tell me, they go, they go, you know, he gave me a, a knee shot, a gel injection, and he didn't even use ultrasound. I mean, it's becoming <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what's expected and the patients know. I mean, like I right. mentioned the patient with the vasectomy pain. He's like, you do ultrasound, right? I go, of course. He's mm -hmm. like, good. He's like, he's like, well, we wouldn't see a doctor who doesn't do ultrasound for this type of yeah. nerve block after what happened. Well, I, I don't think I would let anyone go near my groin with a needle without an ultrasound. <laughs> yeah. Even with an Sorry. ultrasound. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Yeah. Even with <laughs> Uh, you know, and then last, it's like, ultimately, it's about the patient. So really making sure we get maximal pain relief, you know, I'm doing these injections, if I'm, if I'm doing them over and over again, right, I want the accuracy, I want the precision, I want people happy, I want to be happy as a practitioner, I want my patients to experience maximum relief, right, I'm, I'm doing the procedure to help them, I want them to experience that help and really get the best that they can. And I feel like ultrasound really changed my practice on that. Um, you know, uh, lastly, I just wanted to, I sort of skipped ahead here, but like one of the things I love about this job uh, before I hand it back to Genez and to Q&A is like, I, I love that we can engage practitioners everywhere from, you know, all walks of practice and the point of care ultrasound really crosses those disciplinary boundaries. Um, so that here I am talking to pain specialists and we have, you know, physiatrists, podiatrists, orthopods, physiotherapists, ER doctors, critical care, um, naturopaths, people in our allied health, you know, fields, and the ultrasound really can help bring people up, uh, you know, on a gradation of skill and really introduce all these principles into different realms of practice. So I really appreciate it. So uh, before we go to q and I was going to hand it back to Janez here. Thank you so much, Dr. Frankel, um, and also yeah. Dr. Rosenblum, fabulous case studies. Just before we go to our live Q&A with our doctors, I'd like to take a minute just to let you know about Clarius HD. We have focused on making this webinar educational. Clarius HD's high definition wireless ultrasound scanners. Our line of Clarius linear devices are specifically designed for pain management and they deliver several advantages. Clarius is unrivaled for near field and high resolution imaging in a handheld device. And this best in class imaging is what you need for great tissue and needle visualization. As you saw today, you get full visibility of tiny nerves, vascular structures, tendons, and so on for safe needle guided injections. And the secret 
in each of these scanners lies with eight beam formers that deliver the image quality only found in traditional systems, but at a fraction of the cost of cart-based systems and with artificial intelligence to replace complex knobs and buttons. Claris is also wireless, uh, freeing up space with zero footprint for portability in a variety of settings. You get free movement with no more wires touching your sterile prep areas. Um, and Claris is so much easier to clean and disinfect because it's wireless, um, which is all the more important during this pandemic. Um, only Clarius delivers wireless scanners in, with a free ecosystem that includes free apps for your iOS and Android devices um, with free upgrades, unlimited cloud storage to capture and manage your patient exams, and for unlimited users at no additional cost. So there is no subscription fee with Clarius, um, which means you can use a single device and share it among physicians in your practice. What I'd like to do now um, is uh, put up a poll. So again, we wanna focus on educational content with these webinars, um, but if we also wanna make sure that you um, have all the information you need about Clarius um, and its advantages for your practice. So before I open up the um, live Q&A session, what I'm gonna do here is just um, put up a poll. If you'd like to get a quote and pricing on the Clarius HD scanners, we'd be happy to follow up uh, in the coming days. Um, if you'd like to speak to one of our experts, we'd be happy to schedule a discovery call with you. If you'd like to book a Clarius demo, you saw lots of great imaging today, but we can book a live demo um, with you um, in the coming week or two. Um, if you're interested in comparing features with a device that you may be already using, we'd be happy to do that as well. Um, or you can also watch more tutorials. We'd be happy to send them to you by email. So I'm just going to give you five more minutes here um, to complete the poll. Sorry, five more seconds. Um, so five, four, three, two. Oh, so many people voting. I'm going to slow down my seconds. Two, <laughs> <laughs> one. I'm going to end the poll now. Thank you so much. Um, and then what I'm going to do next as well is I'm going to invite you in one final poll to pre-register for our next webinar um, on November 18th. The fabulous Greg Fritz is going to be presenting five ways that ultrasound um, can add value to your MSK practice. So if you want to go ahead and save your seat, just click yes, save my seat. I'll tell you a little bit about the webinar. Um, Greg Fritz is an RMSK expert, um, and he's going to share ultrasound techniques that have improved his vis physiotherapy outcomes. Um, Greg Fritz has honed his ultrasound scanning techniques over the past 14 years as an MSK sonologist. You'll learn how to use ultrasound to improve the accuracy of your diagnoses, to direct better patient treatment, to document progress over time, and ultimately to motivate patients to become your allies on their journey to recovery. It's really powerful when patients get to see um, the cause root of the problem and the pain that they're having and how much more motivated they become uh, to work with you um, in, in, in getting better. Um, so again, simply kick save my seat. And in the coming days, what we'll do is we'll send you your webinar confirmation email. So I'll give you five more seconds. Um, and that is five, four, three, two, one. Thank you. Okay, now without further ado, let's start our live Q&A session. So there is a Q&A box um, on the panel uh, with Zoom. So if you go ahead and click that and ask your questions, your questions are private. And what I will do, there are so many questions coming in here, gentlemen. Um, so let me go ahead and start some of these questions. Um, when injecting tendons, if a patient has a tender point that doesn't correlate with visible tendinopathy, on ultrasound, do you go after the tender area or the visible tendinopathy? Typically, um, oftentimes I'll go what's clinically tender. Now this, is, this differs from referred pain. I mean, sometimes we do nerve blocks and the pain is somewhere else. But when it comes to tendinopathy, if we have an MRI knowing there is a trouble spot, if I can elicit pain at that trouble spot, that's where I'm going. And if there's a different a spot that I just elicit on that's not related to what's on MRI, I may inject that if that is still painful. 
But when the MRI goes along with the exam, and if there's another spot, fine. If I'm deciding between the two spots, oftentimes I don't always trust MRIs. I go really where the patient presents clinically. So I take the whole picture into account and I may go in more than one spot. It really depends. Great. Another question here. Do you perform radio frequency under ultrasound? Great question. Um, I've done it, yes, um, for the knee, for the genicular nerves. Um, when I do cervical medial branch injections or, or radio frequency, I will oftentimes put the knee from a posterior to anterior, lie it flat on the bone, and you look at it with an ultrasound to make sure I'm not near that exiting nerve root, which I can see with the ultrasound. Great. Um, can you get paid for using ultrasound? I think you shared some CPT codes. Uh, yes, yes. I mean, you can, some, some codes are bundled, but you'll get paid the, the 76942 code, which varies from payer to payer, of course. And um, you'll also be able to do things you couldn't do blind. So it really augments your versatility in the office and hence your bottom line in the end of the day. I would add uh, my experience in ultrasound guided procedures is there's often a requirement for archiving the images oh, in yes. order to get compensated for it. And the cloud storage solution uh, makes things really easy that way instead of recording on, a, on an external machine. I know it's a big issue in institutional places like in hospitals of, of archiving scans. Yeah, I, can I make one quick comment? Um, in terms of the archiving, my I've always been producing comment, uh, content, but with once I received the Claris unit with the cloud, I mean, you could press a button here and saves the image without me having to get an assistant to press another button. So while I'm injecting, I save the image. It automatically takes the image from the Claris cloud or their app, and it puts it into my photos on my iPad. And then that image could be edited for presentations, for research, for teaching. So it really facilitated the uh, process of creating academic material in my practice tremendously. Yeah. Terrific, just terrific. And we've got so many questions here. So if we don't get to your question um, during this live Q&A session, we will follow up with you following the webinar. Um, let, me, let me see, maybe we can get through three to four more questions. Is there a difference in the image fidelity of different handheld devices? Yeah, I, there yeah. will be. Uh, you know, some are gonna be variable. Um, you know, I think what I've experienced with Clarius is the, the high frequency probes seem to operate quite well uh, and like maybe best in class, especially on the higher frequency end. Uh, yeah, and then it's different probes that excel at different applications. So there's gonna be a lot of variability. Yeah, I have to say, um, I, I do all sorts of shots in my office. I have the high frequency probe and I'm doing sciatic nerve, paravertebral, very deep shots and I, I'm fine with just this. I, I don't need the low frequency for that. Even though, you know, with certain other types of, pro of, of ultrasounds, you might need to switch probes. We've got another question here. For PRP injections, what is the preferred sub substance of activation? And when is it added before the injection? And what volume of PRP is injected? Great question. I do not activate it with calcium or any of these other things that people are using because the body's... Uh, I, but I think it's a collagen that you inject actually activates it once it comes in contact with it. So you don't need to. In fact, I did PRP on my knee recently because I've been seeing such amazing results with my patients. <laughs> Seriously, I'd rather have that than a steroid. Yeah. I think it's safer. Yeah. So I, I, lately I've been talking to my patients more about PRP, but because of the reimbursement issues or the, the lack mm -hmm. of reimbursement issues, they, don't, they, they still opt for the covered procedures, which I understand. So volume-wise, uh, it depends on what you're injecting. Uh, if you take 30 mLs of blood, you'll get, it depends on the kit, of course, and how much plasma you dilute it with, maybe three mLs. If you take a 60 mL kit, you could get uh, 60 mLs of blood, you get maybe six mLs of PRP. The more plasma you add with it, the more of a risk of getting leukocytes in it. And you might want leukocytes in it, but I typically will do leukocyte poor PRP when I inject. Great, thank you. Um, this one is probably best for you to answer, Dr. Frankel. In an ER setting, which device has the most utility? Uh, between the Clarius devices, you mean? 
Um, mm-hmm. It kind of depends on the practice. You know, I, I really love the linear device for the high, higher frequency, like a 15 megahertz frequency for procedures. Uh, but the, you're kind of dedicated to that. It won't do diagnostics. So uh, the all-in-one would probably be like a phased array transducer that gets you superficial and deep heart, abdominal organs. Um, that's probably your one go-to do-it-all probe. Great. Um, Another question here, um, Dr. Rosenblum, and I know that some of your patients have pain relief for such a long period of time. Um, So this is a great question. How long is the duration of relief of your genecular injections? Varies. Um, From the low end, I mean, it's very rare that I do the genicular nerve block and they walk out of the office in pain. It could happen. I've seen it happen. That often happens if it's a posterior fossa pain, maybe a, a Baker cyst inflamed. Um, but they'll usually walk out of the office with complete numbness, feeling much better. The pain will come back in a few days. When they come back in a week or two to assess them, oftentimes the pain came back, but it's not nearly as bad. And that's even without steroids. I'll add a low dose steroid if they had a knee replacement and there's lots of inflammation, distal or at the knee. Sometimes the distal inflammation will, 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 uh, will or the distal um, swelling will be reduced because you're reducing the obstruction to any lymphatic drainage by using steroid at the at the spot of the most inflammation, which is where they had their knee replacement. Great. Great. Well, we've reached the top of the hour. We've got dozens more questions. If we did not get to your question, um, we will absolutely follow up with you um, in the coming weeks uh, with an email. Uh, with an answer to your question. Um, I'd like to absolutely uh, thank Dr. Oren Frankel and Dr. David Rosenblum for all of your insights today. Really fabulous uh, information that you shared with us. Um, I want to let everyone know that we will be following up with you um, with uh, an email that will include both the PowerPoint slides that you saw today, as well as a recording of today's webinar. Um, and um, I'd like to thank all of you for joining us today, and we'll hopefully see you at our next webinar. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Ines. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Rosenblum. Pleasure. Thank you.